Should we take a year off? A, a year sabbatical, one full year. Have you ever taken one year off? I know as an Australian, uh, we love to take one year sabbaticals when we're, when we're younger, when we're kind of like, we finished high school, we finished university and we go traveling the world. Now, I've taken pretty much a year off. I did it about, uh, around about 19, when did I do it? 1999, 2000, 2003, kind of like that, where you just say, I'm not working for like six months or a year. Um, I did it when I went down and lived in Buenos Aires for six months. I did it for, for six months. I just went down there and it's very cheap to live down there. Cost of living is cheap. So I wasn't really spending much per day and I did a sabbatical and that was enough for me to come back to Los Angeles in 2010, refreshed and ready to quit drinking and uh, change my life around. So we're going to talk to someone today who is uh, the number one best-selling Indian novelist whose first international book comes out in May. His name is Karan uh, Bajaj. Did I pronounce that correctly, Karan? Yes, James, almost. Okay. <laughs> yes, almost. So which one? Uh, Karan Bajaj. There you go. Karan Bajaj. Okay. Yes, that's perfect. Um, welcome, sir. Great to have you here. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure. Now, you take one year sabbaticals every three or four years, do you? So just tell us why you do that. Uh, yes, absolutely. So I follow something like a 313 kind of a rule for the last decade in which I work for three years and then take a year off. And I, what I found is that I've been extremely effective in the three years that I work because of the one year that I take off. And uh, uh, like, so that model is working really well because it's almost that the year that I take off is completely antithetical to the way I live and work in the three years that I'm working. So I think that kind of like, so in the three years that I'm working, I'm extremely tight and goal oriented and disciplined and very hungry for growth. And in the one year that I'm off, I'm consciously goalless. I don't plan a single day. I let, I let it flow. I, and, and that I think that kind of like just loosens everything and it balances this left and right brain, this rational and intuitive side. And I think that's like leading to very good outputs in work. Okay. Yeah. And so how long have you been doing this for? It's been about 10 years now. So, I've, so in, in the sense that I've taken three sabbaticals of one year each, every three years. Okay. And so what did you do? What were you doing sort of before you took the sabbaticals? And then what did you do during the sabbaticals? Uh, yeah. So I uh, like basically the two things that I do when I'm, I guess, not uh, taking the sabbatical is that I have a corporate job. So I worked... Uh, in Procter & Gamble, the Boston Consulting Group, I'm now the chief marketing officer of a startup. So I have this corporate kind of career. And, and I'm also, I also write fiction. And I've written three books. Two of them have been number one bestsellers in India. And the third one just comes out in May um, uh, by Random House. It's called The Yoga of Max's Discontent. So I work and I write. And in the year that I take off, uh, the last sabbatical that I took, I spent four months basically going from Europe to India by road without a plan. Then four months... Uh, in an ashram in India doing meditation, yoga and meditation, and then four months in a artist retreat in Portugal writing, essentially. Yeah. Okay. And to the, to the average, certainly American listener, I would say American person, this sounds kind of like crazy. Now I know it's not crazy because I've done it. Yeah. Um, I, uh, in 2009, when the financial crisis hit, I lost a PR company that I had on Sunset Boulevard here in, uh, in Hollywood. And, uh, I ran away to Buenos Aires, Argentina because I'd read Tim Ferriss's book, the four hour work week. And I figured, well, I'll just go down there. And I didn't even have that much money. Yeah. Say, I mean, I had some money, but I didn't spend that much money when I was down there because I deliberately went to a I don't know if you consider Argentina a third world country, but I went to a country where the, the, the peso was, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the Argentinian uh, currency was very, uh, you know, favorable. So I could have beautiful steak dinners and have good accommodation right. and drink wine yeah. when I was drinking there and do things very, very cheap. So, yeah. and in that time, during that time, I read the book Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, which really triggered a change in all of my relationships. Yeah. So I can really credit like my social, my current social skills 
So having read that book and I can credit reading that book to having taken a, you know, a six month sabbatical at the age of, you know, 30, 34, 30, 34, 35. So, uh, and also, I guess you could also, I could also credit that sabbatical to helping me get a job as a sports center anchor on ESPN because when I came back from my sabbatical and, um, I, uh, you know, was fresh in thought. I decided to quit drinking and then because yeah. I quit drinking, I was clear in thought and then I had a vision to go after this job and I got the job as, as sports center anchor on ESPN. So I can actually look back and go, wow, you know what? That, those sabbatic, that sabbatical really did trigger a lot of amazing things in my life. Yeah, Do you, exactly. Is that, how you, is that how you have found it? Absolutely. Every time. Uh, so the, the two questions that you asked, which I think are very interesting. The first one was that it's outside the zone of what an average American thinks. But the surprising thing is that uh, I've done it within the context of American corporations. Right. So like, so the three companies that have given me sabbaticals are Procter and Gamble, the Boston Consulting Group and Kraft Foods, which are as American as you can get in a way. Right. Uh, and I feel like what happens is that we all reach points in our mid careers or whichever, where we want to make a change. And then we just like quit and go start our own companies or do something like that. But like, here is a different model in which you can just like take a break from your company. And if you ask, they do give it to you. I think most people don't even ask because either they don't have the imagination to, or they don't know what they'll do in the year. So I think in one sense, I think it's much easier than people think it is in, in getting that from your uh, company, if you will. And then the second points that you made are absolutely excellent. I think what happens is that you end up living a completely different life uh, in the year that you have off. Like, so for instance, if I think about the last sabbatical, uh, for the four months that I was, I was like in an ashram in India, like meditating and like living or sleeping on a floor in the ashram and taking cold, cold showers in the Himalayas that like willful poverty, physically, that lack of emotional materialism in a way, because I think what happens with people like us is that we are, we are away from physical materialism. Like we don't think of houses and cars and stuff, but we get into this emotional materialism of wanting friendships and wanting to meet the right people, always connecting, growing constantly. And I think that emotional materialism also leads to a lot of noise. And in that year that you're off, I just also let go of that need to hunger to grow all the time and like meet connections and do this. I'm just reading one or two books and meditating. And, and then you come back with like completely different perspective and then life changes accordingly. You know, uh, for, like for me, that's what's happened is that I came back and I actually get promoted faster in my work. I like, so just things just start to happen because I'm much more silent inside, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, it's funny, you know, because I, I took a lot of mini sabbaticals, I guess, through my twenties and to, yeah. in, into my, in my thirties, like I did go off and travel and take a year off and I went backpacking through, through yeah. the U S uh, sorry, through, um, uh, through the Middle East, I went from Cairo up through um, Jordan and uh, Syria and uh, Israel, Lebanon, up to Turkey, to Istanbul. I did that trip and then I spent time in, in Asia, in Thailand and uh, India, where you're from, and Malaysia. And, uh, wow. you know, I've been all through South America. I remember taking, I think, three, three months off where I went, um, started in in um, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And then I went up through Peru and climbed, did the Inca trail to Machu, yeah. P Machu Picchu. I went to Bolivia. And uh, then later on, I would, I ended up in Colombia and I ended up living in Colombia on and off for, for a couple of years, which was kind of like a sabbatical in the sense that yeah. I was just working when I wanted to work, yeah. but most of the time I was just doing whatever. Um, you know what? It was all those trips were amazing, and it shaped who I am. There is one. There's one thing I'm. I'm still not completely sold on doing like a full massive sabbatical because I'm 40 years old, and I feel like I'm playing catch up when it comes to my financial life. Um, in the sense that if I had not have taken those sabbaticals, maybe then maybe I would have focused a lot, a lot more on wealth management and creating wealth and, 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 and things like that. So I don't know. I like, 
I, I absolutely see all the pros and positives of taking the year off and taking breaks and do that. It's just, it shaped who, who I am. But I yeah. wish that when I did it, I actually integrated financial and wealth management learning into those sabbaticals because otherwise, you know, I wouldn't feel like I'm like trying to like, you know, really focus and be really goal orientated mm. now so I can really achieve my financial, financial goal. Yeah. What yeah. do you think about that? No, I think it's a very interesting question. The economics of it are like very surprising for me. So I'll give you a very tangible example, right? Um, the 313 model helps me a lot for the economics of it because the three years that I'm working, uh, like I'm working very hard and working on my job and working on my writing or whatever, and I'm accumulating wealth during that time, right? So I'm conscious about saving because I know that a year is going to come where I spend money, right? So I think that helps a little bit to to know going in that I'm about to kind of like uh, spend money without making it. So there's no objective to make money in the year off. Having said that, what I've seen very surprisingly is that I'm always richer after a sabbatical. And I'll give you an example of just the latest one, right? Two year, three years ago when I was off, uh, I spent a year, I, I spent only 25,000 and me and my wife went together. We spent $25,000 that year because like, honestly, you don't spend more than that when you're living in an ashram for four months and you're staying like backpacking in hostels and stuff. Um, and then when I got a book deal from Random House for a six figure book deal from Random House at the end of the sabbatical for the novel that I'd written. And I've seen this consistent pattern that the growth that you have as a person returns in some tangible outcome. And in that way, it's a very tangible outcome that I wrote a novel that got a book deal with Random House for six figures, right? So that's even more tangible. But in, in, in general, like I, I, feel, I felt that it's financially always paid out, even if it's a drain in the short term, if you will, you know? Well, you'd have to say for me, in my example, it, yeah. it, it panned out because I came back and I got my, landed my dream job of hosting Sports Center on ESPN right exactly. after my sabbatical, you know, and yeah. that's led to many other things. So, yeah. And that's and then, happened to me consistently, exactly, because it's always happened that I don't know how exactly, but when you come back, it does lead to, because you've grown as a person and that has some value in the world even yeah. if you don't know what it is immediately, you know? And then I remember when I, even going back a few years earlier yeah. in 1998, when I quit my job as a newspaper reporter and I went traveling for three months and then I arrived in London in the, I think it was February or March of 1999. And I was sleeping on a friend's sofa for, you know, four or five, six weeks. And I'd lost all my money. I spent all my money and the yeah. town was very strong. But then, but then on day on week six, I landed a job at, at Sky Sports as a as a, a cricket and rugby reporter at Sky Sports. Um, Amazing. Got a got a great job there. So I guess you could say there's there's correlation, and then I guess you could say the sabbatical that I took in Colombia, where I was there just kind of hanging out, learning some Spanish, and doing a little bit in there. I was learning online marketing, which kind of inspired me along the path to to build an online business. Which then, when I came back to Los Angeles, I met. Ty Lopez, who's now my my business coach and mentor. Uh, mm. If you want to follow Ty, you can. If you're listening to this, you want to follow him. Just go to my website, jameswanick.com forward slash sixty seven steps. He has a program called Sixty Seven Steps. And um, so, yeah, as we're talking now, I guess I'm seeing a correlation between yeah. take, taking time off, what you would call a sabbatical, and then monumental change happening. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's a uh, yeah. You, you just have to surrender to the fact that you don't know what that change is. Like it's not a, it's not such a goal directed sabbatical that you know that I'm taking a year off to start an online business. You're actually taking a year off to do nothing or like, you know, just become completely goalless. So there's that fall into the unknown, but, um, but you do like end up like that fall into the unknown always helps you land on your two feet in almost a better way. At least that's what I've found so far. Right. Yeah. Let me uh, let me play devil devil's advocate on yeah. this um, a, a little bit. Uh, Ty Lopez, who I mentioned just before, yes. is a very successful multimillionaire, creator of many businesses. Says uh, that his uh, mentor told him that if you need uh, his mentor was a guy called Joel Salatin, who's very famous um, in agri- agricultural world here in the United States, and. Um, he said that he said, if you need to take a, va- a vacation from your job, then, you know, from your, from your life, then, you know, you don't have a very good life or you don't have a very good job. Like do 
what you would ordinarily do anyway. So he says, do for work or do for, for your job or do for money what you would ordinarily do if you weren't getting paid for it. So Ty has been very successful in mm-hmm. uh, living a life now where he has a home in Beverly Hills uh, and he has world-class mentors coming to his home every single day to coach him in martial arts, in basketball, in poker, in logic, in business training, in the piano, uh, in uh, yoga, uh, a chiropractor comes. So all of these world-class mentors come to his home every single day and he films him getting this and he pays them. He pays a lot of money for it, you know, thousands of dollars for these mentors to come. And he builds programs and teaches people around the world and they pay him for it. So his business is his life. So what do you say to the idea of we shouldn't be trying to take sabbaticals. We should just be enjoying our life and integrating our work and our job and our money-making activities into our daily life, you know, anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, so there are two, two kind of thoughts that I, like I have, uh, one is a very practical thought that like as an, a little bit as an artist, as a writer, um, especially as a fiction writer, as a novelist, I do believe to an extent in the sex and cash theory, if you will. So the old sex and cash theory that what you do for cash should not be what you do for sex. You should keep it separate in a way. So like your true creativity comes when you are completely not obligated to do it for any other reason than to fulfill your soul. So, and that, so, and I personally have found it that's been very, very, very effective for my writing. Uh, when I compare to people who become full-time novelists in India, like so to give you India as an example, I've seen that the moment people have turned the switch from becoming uh, writing the first novel to becoming full-time novelists, their quality of output has started to reduce because they've started to write to audiences and this and that. And while I've seen that, like, since I've never relied on like writing for my income at all, I've always been very pure to what has been very close to my soul at that point and that's always grown and changed and I've never written to a genre or an audience so in some way I feel that my full creative expression is coming because my sex and cash streams are separated and I feel like in a way the same way about a little bit about the sabbatical is that if I'm not that I'm very pure and selfless in what I'm doing when I'm not linking it to money at all and and that leads to very good output so that's kind of one kind of thought and the second thought where I this this like a little bit uh, have a different opinion than uh, Ty Lopez is that uh, I feel we are very multidimensional people. And when you tie your life to one dimension, which you're working in and making money in, I don't know if you're fully even understanding and knowing who you are and what you're capable of versus if you just take a break from all of that and spend four months meditating, I, I can guarantee you that some part of you will transform, change, become deeper, and you'll figure out things that you didn't know about yourself, if you will. Like, I didn't even know I'm an engineer, a business school graduate. I didn't even know I could write a novel. I mean, how would I ever know that? Like, I've never had any training for that. But it was after the first sabbatical that I started to think that I could capture those experiences and it ended up becoming a number one bestseller in India. The point being that I didn't know that those dimensions existed within me. Right. So with those two thoughts, I have a little bit of a different opinion that like your, like, I think life is not just one stream of constant activity, but uh like a series of like deep explore deeper and deeper explorations within you if you will you know right yeah yeah it's it's uh it's fascinating isn't it because there's so many different ways we can choose to live our lives yeah. isn't <laughs> yes yes that's how, that of course is true yeah i mean we can live it we can <laughs> yes. we can take a nine to five job and work monday through friday and have the weekends off and be right. happy with that yeah we can work for ourselves from home Right. And make our own hours mm-hmm. and work, yeah. you know, a certain time of the year and take one day off a week. We can integrate our work into our life and never take a day off ever yeah. and, and yeah. love that and enjoy yeah. our life. We can work for three years and take a one year sabbatical with the goal of doing absolutely nothing yeah. and living off savings and, uh, or, or investments or whatever. Yeah. There's, we can get caught up in the, in, in what I would, you know, describe as the American dream, which is work, 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 make, make, make money, make money, make money, yeah. buy nice things, build, start a family and, you know, live a nice life that way. Or we can uh, work, 
for a few <laughs> months, take off a few months, work for a yeah. few months, take off a few months, yeah, take off a year, take off yeah. two years. I mean, <laughs> yes. it's really quite a fascinating life that we can live life whatever we want. But the issue is, is that even you suggesting that you would take a one year sabbatical to some people would be just so confronting and so overwhelming and so like out of the realms of possibility, they would consider it out of the realms of possibility because their environment has always been work weekends, work, save up for a vacation yep. and, and so forth. So we have this societal pressure, don't we? We have yep. this, this, uh, these social norms, yeah. wherever we grew up, whatever our parents did, whatever our friends do, that kind of dictates how we think about that. So how do we really break out of whatever mindset we have on this and actually take the plunge? Now, in this example, we're talking about someone who works and then is like, how do they take the plunge of like literally taking a year off? We can use that as an example, but it might be the same mentality for someone who's a slacker and who's yeah. weed and plays video games all day and never gets anywhere and that's their life and they want to break out of that norm and actually build a business yeah and focus on building uh, you know take a break from taking a break you know yeah, to, yeah. Right. people can you can go too far down the rabbit hole and, and yeah. quite lazy and unproductive so how does someone really break the norm i guess is and take the plunge in, in, in taking a year off or, or, or something similar. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, James, I think it starts with building the muscle in, in, in smaller spans. So what I see the problem is that when people take vacations from their work or whatever, they take a vacation and they'll go to a beach resort. And then it's some kind of a physical vacation, but it's not truly a, like a mental vacation. Like you're not truly taking a break from your mind. It's the same person who's going to a different environment in a more relaxed setting. Where I start with is that if you start building the muscle of taking these 10 or 10 day breaks, which are deeper, more meaningful and away from your, uh, I, I guess from your physical materialism kind of of your life. So for instance, a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat, which is a silent meditation retreat. I've climbing, done that, yeah. yeah, you've done that. Climbing Kilimanjaro for a of like you're so so you're so involved and absorbed in that activity that you're doing that you forget yourself if you will and you forget your conditioning and you start building that muscle in 10 day increments which is possible to everyone instead of going to bora bora or whatever if somebody can go to like a like like a, a like a remote vipassana retreat or climb kilimanjaro all these are very accessible what starts to happen then is that you start to declutter a lot and you start realizing uh, for instance, when you're climbing Kilimanjaro or like, you know, hiking the Camino de Santiago, you start realizing that this is all I need. Like, you know, me with the backpack and walking. And, and I guess that's complete. And I think all the other things that I've set up around myself are not perhaps necessary. So I think you start building the muscle with small activities that are very accessible to everyone versus taking even a, con like, so uh, unconventional vacations lead to, I guess, slowly starts leading to a more unconventional life, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's one approach. And then my second uh, idea there is, James, is creation. I think the act of creating something, whatever that be, writing, music, painting, art, your business, online business, whatever. But the moment you start getting moving from a consumption mode to a creation mode, I think that opens up very new channels in your life. Like for me, for instance, the moment I started writing a novel, it started opening this idea that in order to fill the well, I had to need, I needed more experiences and then I sought more experiences and then I needed to constantly replenish the well with more experiences. So the moment I moved to creation mode, the, the imperative to have more depth as a person became very high. Right. So I think that's what I recommend again, like anybody can start creating something and that like opens a whole new door that you didn't know existed. You know? So I think creation and vacations is what I would say. I would suggest if, if anyone listening yeah. or watching this is, is young, like the finished college or whatever, I would say go and take a year off and just travel around the world. That's like wherever you are, like whether you're in America or Canada or Australia or England or wherever you're listening or watching and you're still young, just take a year off. It was the best thing that happened to me. I mean, yes. I, went, I went through Europe. I saw, you know, like Italy, Greece, Spain. I went through, through 
you know, like I saw the places in Syria now where no one would ever go because, because of ISIS yeah. and all the drama there. I actually was there. It was wonderful. Now, Palmyra is this anxious, ancient city. I went and, and, and explored that beautiful, that beautiful, those beautiful ruins there in Syria. You can't go there now. ISIS actually captured it and, and, oh. and damaged it. Um, and blew up some of the, the, some of the monuments there. And, um, but you know, that was a wonderful experience. And I remember there were days where I had a lot of solitude for a couple of days. I didn't really talk to anyone else. I was living, staying in a little hostel and I didn't, I sort of kept to myself. Those experiences really shape yeah. your personality and you, it shows you that you can just do whatever truly yeah. in lots of different situations, you know, yeah. um, even when I was in, uh, what happened? Even when I was in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, yeah. I got I was watching the cricket. Australia was playing the West Indies in the in a cricket cricket game at um, can't remember what the name of the park was. Anyway, I, I drank too much beer and I got too much sun and I had uh, I ate too much food and I got food poisoning and I ended up in a hospital wow. uh, in in Trinidad and Tobago. And <laughs> even that, as bad as it was in the moment was an experience that I, yeah. that I laugh about now and, and joke about. And now if I get into a similar situation, I know exactly what to do because I yeah. have experience. So, you know, you obviously don't wish that upon you, but there's something about being in a foreign land and being in a different culture where even if seemingly bad things happen to you in the moment, yeah. like you get so much experience from getting out of the, right. those situ- situations. Yeah, I agree. Because subconsciously, somebody registers subconsciously that like, if I can survive a hospital in Trinidad, I can definitely start my own business. I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know, like, I think if you have so many such experiences, I think it starts to shape you in terms of what level of difficulty you can handle. You well, know, you know so what, I, even the, even me doing that 10 day silent meditation, the Vipassana, yeah. I did it in a place called, uh, um, I think it's Nine Palms. It's just outside of the Joshua Tree area, about two hours from Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And I did it there in September 2013. In fact, if you're listening or watching and you want to see, I did a video on it called my 10-day silent meditation. You can just go to my YouTube channel, which is James Swanick, and type in my name, James Swanick and Vipassana, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. And you can see I do a little six-minute video of me going in and then I, I, I secretly took a, a, a sneaky little photo on one of the days. You um, did? Okay. And then on the last day, when I, I, on the last day, I took a video of me coming out of there. And you can see the transformation in me. When I'm going in, I'm kind of like stressed and anxious. And when I come out, I'm like super relaxed and, and chilled. But even that 10-day silent meditation really was like a reboot, like a reset for me and gave me a lot of clarity on what it is that I needed to do once I got out of that 10 day meditation. So is it, is a 10 day sabbatical? What's the shortest sabbatical that we can take to be effective? Do do you think? Oh no, I think 10 days is wonderful. I think any time the principle is that any time you're taking a vacation from your mind, if you will, that I like, I feel like if you just go from like a, like home luxury to luxury, you're not truly deconstructing and breaking as a person. So things like this Vipassana for 10 days or climbing Kilimanjaro for five days or Machu Picchu, Inca Trail you mentioned. These are like small bursts of activities that are so absorbing, so completely absorbing that you are deconstructing what you know for that period of time. And as a result, you truly come back with a, you know, for the lack of a better word, with a different perspective. So I think that, and and while when you're not pushing yourself to that level, you're just kind of like changing a, physical environment but not truly taking a a break if you will a sabbatical if you will so any length of time that's i that's what i feel yeah it's a break from your mind really it doesn't even have to be a a break from your physical location exactly yeah although breaking from your physical location by its very nature will give you more creativity because you'll be in a different environment it's good yes to a different environment so but as but really it's a break from break from your mind. I mean, I know I got a lot of things going on. I got a, I got a podcast. I got a 30 day no alcohol challenge program. I got a business called Swannies where I sell blue bucking glasses. I, I do sales calls for Ty Lopez. I am, I speak on stage at his events. I uh, have staff who work for me in different, different time zones around the world. I mean, I got a, a lot of stuff going on and even having this conversation is making me realize, man, I want to actually, now I want to go and take a damn sabbatical, you know? <laughs> uh, but, 
but I enjoy like what I do. I enjoy, but I am very much driven right now by yeah. building those businesses. So when is the right time to say stop building for a while or put structure and system in place where it can do okay without you? And when's the time to say no? You know what? I got to keep going now. Yeah, I mean that's why for me that three one three or four one four, whatever your system works a lot for me because it's very at least I'm very left brain. As I said, I'm an engineer, etc. It's very I am quite analytical, so it's almost like I know the start and the finish time. So in during that start and finish time, I'm never questioning my place in the world. Am I working too hard? Am I do like it's almost like I'm very clear that it's a very defined period of time that I'm gonna give it all because I know that there is a, about to come a period of time where I'm not, where I'm just going to completely, and you never take time off because uh, like if you're driven, you're driven. You just take time off from your life as you know it. And you, I guess, channelize that driven energy into, I don't know, a different pursuit that you like writing or meditation or whatever, which is very, I guess, a pursuit of the soul, if you will, versus a pursuit of the world. Um, but I, but since that timeline is very clear in my mind, it makes me very present in every moment. Um, you know, so I think that helps versus a lose. Maybe one day I'll take time off. That's too, like, you know, that's too, uh, like, uncontrolled for me, if you will, you know. How much, um, how much money do you think we need in order to, to take a year off? And, you know, what tips do you have in terms of doing? Because obviously, if you're going to take a year off and money is a concern, you don't want to be heading to London, for example. <laughs> right, exactly. Or New yeah. York. Or New York City, if you know, if your finances are concerned. So, how how much money do we need, and where should we go if we want to really extend those? The yeah. So, I mean, I, I know the developing world very well. Obviously, Thailand, India, all of that stuff. You live on a, a, a like a fraction of the money that you live here. Like, so for instance, the last one I'm talking about, three, two and a half years ago in Goa in India, we had a villa by the beach for six hundred dollars a month. And a cook who was making food for us for three hundred dollars a like a month. So you're talking a total living expense of fifteen hundred when you live like a king a month, right? So you're like, and that's living like a king. You could really cut it down. I'm just saying, and especially if you like, for now we went with a family. So like we have two kids now, so two babies really, and we are going to spend four months in Costa Rica, four months in Spain, and four months yet defined, but in Philippines. And again, we are looking at a budget of about two and a half, $2,500 a month um, with the family. So I think for an individual, it's about $18,000 for the full year. 1500 a month is what I think you should budget for. And, and for a family, I would budget for 2500 or $3,000, Um but again, if you dis, if you push the numbers, because like you're you're still looking at something like a twenty five thousand dollars to a forty thousand dollar investment, individual or a family, which I think is is a lot. But again, you again, if you're focused on working for the three years, you do accumulate thing, and then I've again seen again and again that it pays back to me. Like uh, like it doesn't pay back in that immediate moment, but at the end of the year, eighteen month, it always comes back. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so it's access places. I mean, I can tell you living in yeah. South America, there's some wonderful, South, yeah. Sorry. South America is some, some terrific places to live there. Argentina and Colombia probably wouldn't suggest Venezuela at this point. Um, but uh, certainly Argentina and, and Colombia, Chile, certain parts of Chile are, are, are terrific. Uh, Thailand, yeah. Thailand is always super cheap. Yeah. Um, uh, India is still very, very cheap if you, you're going there with the US dollars. And Goa, I mean, I, I stayed two weeks in Goa. Goa is a, yeah. the, if anyone who's never been to Goa in India, um, there's a scene in the Bourne Supremacy. It's the second movie in the, in the Jason yeah. Bourne movies. That's where the movie starts off, where Jason Bourne's running down, running along the beach, and the bad guy finds he and his yes. friend and chases him. That's. <clears throat> That's go. So if it was good enough for Jason Bourne, it should be good. <laughs> right, exactly. But I remember I was there and I ate beautiful Indian meals every night and I got massages every day and I spent you know, very little amount of money. And then I was in, I uh, remember I went to Egypt and I was, I can't remember where I was in Egypt. Is it Dahab? I think it's called Dahab. It's a little, little, little um, coastal town. I was there for a couple of weeks. I recall in about 2002 and, um, you know, there's a lot of places in the world where are pretty amazing where you can get by on not much, not much money. Truly. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your book, your books and what, 
book you have coming up and, and how you've written those books, you know, fitting into your sabbatical life, if you like. Yeah, I mean, like it's been a, a the, so the new one is called The Yoga of Max's Discontent. It comes out on May 3rd with Random House Worldwide. And uh, it's about an investment banker who becomes a yogi in the Himalayas. And it's like a part uh, adventure through you know, hidden night markets and caves and ashrams in India. And part of it is obviously a spiritual transformation. Um, yeah, I think like, again, the act of writing through the sabbaticals has been a, for me, it's been the biggest thing has been this stripping away of emotional materialism, because I've seen that I have a tendency to become very emotionally materialistic. What I mean by that is I'm constantly seeking growth and learning and reading a lot. And, and I think what's happened with this novel, for instance, is, that I, for the year that we were off, I just read two books again and again. I didn't have a Kindle. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a computer. So I, like, I, I think I just kind of tapped into something within myself versus aggregating ideas from the world. So I think it's been a journey of like simplification, purification, stripping, stripping life off and trying to find my answers within myself, which has led to, I think, a very honest book like the reviews are saying that also again and again the reviews are very are much better than any of my previous novels like it's very very good reviews mm -hmm. and they're all uh, I think it's come because I was very silent while I was writing it and not hungry for emotional growth if you will I was just okay I was complete within myself and I think that came led to a very honest effort if you will you know so the book that you have coming up the yoga of max's discontent yeah it's inspired by your sabbatical, okay? And, and I see you got a pretty nice review here from the Daily Telegraph in the UK, which called it the greatest adventure of our generation. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah, some good reviews. I like, you know, I've had very positive reviews with this one, yeah. And what were the, what were the names of the other novels that you had? Uh, the first one is called Keep of the Grass. That was way back in India in 2008. The second one is called Johnny Gone Down. They're Indian, uh, they're in India only. And this is my first kind of like worldwide novel. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And what's the theme, the theme then of the yoga of Max's discontent? What, what's the theme of that book? Uh, the theme, like all my novels are in a bit man on a quest, which I think people like us will relate to a lot because we are all on quest. But I think I've always, this one is a good example in which there is a, the, the metaphorical quest, if you will, is very well packaged within a physical quest through, which is an adventure through India. Like, you know, uh, through night markets and uh, like hidden ashrams and all that stuff. So it's a very, so it's a story of a man completely transforming, but with a physical backdrop. Like, so it's very heavy on a physical hiking and like hiking through mountains and climbing. So it's like, it's, it's the physical adventure leads to an emotional transformation. Yeah. Which makes it very page turning and yet deep in a way, you know. Which part of India are you from, Karan? I grew up in the Himalayas, so in Shimla, which is a small town in the mountains. Okay. Uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, yeah, but you know, like since then, I lived in many parts of India before moving out. Yeah. So you've, you've experienced it all. You lived in New York City and the, the hustle yes. and bustle, and then you backtracked, backpacked from Europe <laughs> to India, and then you've learned yoga and meditation in the Himalayas. Like you've had a well-rounded life. That seems like it's very important to you. Yeah, it is. You know, like I hope, I hope to be able to continue that. And I think having kids has given another dimension to it now. Uh, like it's uh, because we are not letting go of the sabbatical life. We are just thinking of it now differently, you know, of how to pull, this, pull it off with kids. So that's the next challenge, if you will. How is that? How is it different doing the sabbatical with kids? So the frame, has, like earlier, we would like, for instance, the last one we went, uh, we, we made no booking at all right we landed in we just took the cheapest flight to scotland because that was cheap and then from scotland we for four months we just didn't plan even a single day like so we ended up in bulgaria for two weeks now with kids you can't do that with two babies so now we're thinking of like four months in one location uh, four months in an orphanage like so we kind of just planning experiences around them so like we want to learn spanish as a family for four months and then in four months like work with our hands in an orphanage so that they can like, you know, like otherwise they grow up in New York, you know, they'll hail Ubers and, you know, like every life is very simple. And I think it'll be good to work in Cambodia as a whole family and work with our hands for four months together. So we want to do this stuff now, like move to more uh, like things that would make sense in their lives, you know, versus just uh, let's backpack and travel. Like, you know, because when you're four years old, 
backpacking through like you know seeing new things doesn't make much sense you want to have a consistent predictable routine in your life and we want to give them routines that are helping them grow but also like you know uh, just make give them a consistent predictable pattern for the day yes okay yeah. so yeah well this has been very interesting um pleasure funny, you know, yeah. just even even that last point there it's like you know do you get to the point where you like you try to get your financial house in order to have kids and prepare for it and then you have kids and then you stay in the one place and you know versus do you just take your kids traveling with you and you take a sabbatical it's like so many different ways to to live yeah. our lives aren't there it's it's fascinating are, yeah but yeah but traveling with kids is your definition of fun is very different from theirs i think <laughs> you know that's <laughs> <laughs> like seeing a new waterfall in africa will have no like for them it's like it's boring you know not like just like a waterfall and not like oh this wonderful site and like you know they they take pleasure from very different things so yeah. you got to like uh, customize your life a bit you know yeah. well karan thank you so much where can we find out more about you uh karanbajaj.com www.karanbajaj.com which is my website has a blog on meditation and writing and stuff so that's uh that's a very good place and and then obviously all the usual stuff if you real karan bajaj on twitter and instagram author karan bajaj on facebook yeah i'm going to spell it out uh, for the listener yes. here as well karan bajaj which is k a r a n b a j a j k a r a n karan bajaj b a j a j dot com i'm on your website here now it says modern life through a yogic prism which is cool how to meditate for passion of meditation how to get published worldwide there's some cool things on here thank you yeah try nice to make stuff. it informative yeah <laughs> and uh so yeah congratulations karan i'm very uh happy for you and uh thank you for sharing your your, your story about uh you know taking a sabbatical it's something that i'm now you've reignited the sabbatical in me. I should go and take a few more, even though I've done it consistently over my yeah. life. I should do a bit more of it, right? Yeah, you've done a lot, though. <laughs> to give you credit, like you've done most than anybody would do in one lifetime. So, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah. it. No, thank so, you, James. This has been a pleasure, and um, you know, thank you for your generosity in in interviewing and being so open. Thank you. Thank you, Karan. Take care. Bye.